This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. Welcome everyone to the Weekend Review here on the WWE Podcast for this Sunday, October 22nd, 2023. We're going to talk about all the events that happened this week and on the backside of the show, clean up the rest of the mailbag emails and calls that we got that we didn't get to in the typical mailbag this past week. So those of you who didn't hear your email or voicemail, well, uh, you're going to get to at the back end of the show. But uh, first, welcome to the WWE Podcast, everybody. It is time to talk about this week in WWE. And as a reminder, if you want everything ad-free, Patreon's the way to go, guys. $1 a month to start gets you in the door. All right. So we got... First thing on my mind here is Bianca Belair returning during a Charlotte Flair and EO Sky uh, Women's Championship match, WWE Women's Championship match. I really enjoyed her return. I didn't expect it, and it felt like she needed that break to refresh herself. And she looked good. She felt fresh-ish compared to what she has in the past. The crowd reacted to her very positively. And they firmly placed EO Sky in the heel role while Charlotte Flair played the babyface pretty well in that matchup. And uh, we got a, uh, you know, uh, another Charlotte Flair title match, but one that did not end with her winning. Although, had it not been for the interference of Bailey, you could argue that we would be looking at a 15 time WWE Women's Champion in Charlotte Flair, but that did not happen. And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole EO Sky run is, as I've said previously, it's been very underwhelming, disappointing, uh, to say the least. And I don't know if partly the crowd is to blame, partly creative. I'm putting a lot of this on creative. And I know that's the easy thing to do, given I am a fan instead of placing the blame on myself. Um, it's because creative essentially has ignored her since she won the belt. They have done nothing with her of substance. She has been an outside figure. It has been really about Bailey and Charlotte with no title involved. They don't give EO Sky a voice. And yes, there are ways to do that. And she has felt like kind of an afterthought as a champion. And it's been it's been frustrating for those that are EO fans. And you hear the reaction when she was introduced too, right, you know, which was uh, just indifference, not sure how to react crowd is just kind of uh, not they're not down on EO they just don't know what to do with her and I think as time goes on perhaps they have firmed her in that heel role but at the same time people are still waiting for Bailey to turn on her and that way we get an EO Sky babyface run and that's still in the cards but it's just dragging out and I don't know why it's dragging out uh, I don't mind if Charlotte wins if it gets the title off EO to get Bailey versus EO. Even without the title, um, you can have a, a, a three way with those three. And again, so I'm just a bit disappointed in how they have so far executed the the run of EO Sky, which hasn't exactly been you know one for the ages. But the real story is Bianca Belair, and you know you do wonder when Jade Cargill. And Bianca Belair are going to come face to face. Now, if Jade does go to Raw, which many are speculating, and then that, of course, leaves them off separate brands and for a match down the line. But it's going to happen. I, I've said this since she was still a part of AEW that I'd like to see it. And sure, from just a visual standpoint, it would be fascinating. You, know, you, you have Bianca Belair, who we thought was jacked, and then you have, you know, freak of nature and Jade Cargill come in and just even overpowered Bianca, which is going to be a, a sight to behold when those two lock up. And uh, the, the interesting question is not only if or when they will, of course they will, who's the heel and babyface in the counters? You know, that, that that's a it's another story for another day. I mean, you could argue either, depending on how things are going and when it happens. But fantasy booking is, of course, 
you know, a, a topic that all of us could dive deep into. But let's talk about reality. Let's talk about what happened this week. And continuing with Logan Paul. Now, Logan Paul has been absent for a while. He had a boxing match, what, last week, six days ago, or seven days ago as I record this. And he was victorious. He's a hell of an athlete. He just exudes confidence, ego, everything that you'd want a heel to have. He just has. He feels like he's come into his own. He doesn't feel so out of his element like he has in the past. He kind of does exactly what he said he was this past week. He does truly feel like he knows who he is. And he says he's a WWE uh, superstar. And, you know, I can't argue with him as much as the, uh, the the arguments against Logan Paul being there. He's jumped, you know, eight different people to get where he is and that he doesn't deserve to be where he is. Well, I mean, the, the, re, the crowd reaction would say otherwise. I'm not sitting here supporting Logan Paul. I'm supporting him as a heel because he fits the role perfectly. So that to me is uh, enough for me to say, hey, you know, he does damn good in matches. He has no business being as good as he is at his level with six televised matches. It's absolutely insane. But good for him. And the U.S. title could very well come home with him at Crown Jewel with Rey Mysterio being challenged and Rey Mysterio officially accepting. I expect a very entertaining match, one that really could end with Logan Paul winning. There's a very high chance, in fact, that that could be the case. And when you think about it, if L.A. Knight loses, and there's a very high chance of L.A. Knight losing at Crown Jewel because I think they, they pulled the trigger too soon, unless this is just a preview of what's to come at WrestleMania 40, given there's no rock and it's Roman and LA Knight at WrestleMania 40, potentially where you could have LA Knight get screwed. He has to scratch and claw his way back up the whole fun story. And it, I'm not mocking it. It would be fun. Uh, and having him win the rumble. And then that's where he's forced to face LA Knight again. And LA Knight climbs the mountain at WrestleMania 40, which is a more likely scenario than doing this. Now, if this is a one-off for WWE, by the way, and I know I'm not going off. I'm trying not to do a tangent here. But if they don't give LA Knight another chance after this very, very high likelihood of him losing at Crown Jewel, then that's a travesty because they have something very special with LA Knight here. And, and you know, if, if this to them as well, we'll get this out of the way and get the fans happy and then we'll move on to somebody else like who we really want to win, like Cody Rhodes, then uh, it, it would be to me a big misstep. I think there is more general support and uh unified support from all races and uh, sexes, right? Both men and women, I think, love LA Knight right now. Most demographics do. I don't really hear anybody not supporting LA Knight. Has that very rare unified solid uh, or solidarity behind him among all demographics, which is very difficult to do. And I think there's more general support for him. So if they think Cody Rhodes is going to be a better candidate, Putting my feelings aside, I don't think Cody Rhodes has that unified support as much as LA Knight does. So uh, that's just my take. But all right, well, uh, back to LA Knight, or rather uh, back to uh, Ray Mysterio and Logan Paul. I thought it was a solid segment. Again, Logan Paul is very comfortable on the microphone. And, you know, he already said he beat Ray Mysterio, but he's now chasing the U.S. title, which he actually announced after his boxing match last week. After he was victorious. And boy, can he fight. I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to get in a fight with Logan Paul. I, I mean, the dude. Say what you want about him. Egomaniac. Whatever. He, yeah, he is a athletic uh, just juggernaut. Um, he has the perfect kind of fighting body. Long reach. High cardio. Smart. Quick reflex. I mean, the dude has it. Um, unless I hit him from behind with a steel chair, that's probably my only shot. And then, you know, after that, maybe use a taser. I, I mean, just th the fact that he is in WWE is actually an asset. And I've said, and I've never been a Logan fan on a personal level, but I can be objective and still see reality and say that this guy's got it. And I hope at some point Logan Paul adopts the uh, more consistent schedule, not every week, just as we didn't see Roman Reigns this week. And I'm actually okay with that. You know, when he returned, I said, okay, you know, I don't expect him to be here next week. He doesn't need to be here every week, but what I do need him here to be for is every single PLE from now through WrestleMania. So that's my expectation of Roman. 
But for Logan Paul, I think Logan Paul is at a point where he also doesn't need to be there every single week. But I also, if he's going to take this a little bit more full time, be there every PLE as well. Um, and he did say he knows who he is. So maybe that, w- and he said he was a WWE superstar. So maybe, maybe that was his clue into saying, hey, I'm going to be here around here a little bit more than I normally have. You know, I know he's got a million projects going on. He's got his pretty bad drink for you, by the way. Um, loaded with sugar, caffeine. I mean, <laughs> so the prime energy drink, it's not the worst thing in the world, but I'll tell you, it's not exactly a, a health nuts dream when you look at the prime drink. So uh, take a look at that if you care about such things. But nonetheless, the guy is a multimillionaire and one of the biggest social media stars in the world right now and is on top of it ultra athletic and also a, uh, you know, no, just unbelievably talented in the ring for how few times he's been in the ring. So, you know, I'm, I'm expecting big things from him and I expect him actually early take to take the U S title. As I said, I expect him to win the U S title because Ray Mysterio as great as he is. And as much of a legend as he is, doesn't need the title right now. The LWO is a fun little game that they're playing right now. And I'm sorry, I, like I like the LWO, but I don't take them seriously as a faction that they're ever going to be in the main event of anything or in, you know, they're just face off against the bloodline in any serious context. I just, I don't see that. They're, they're a fun group and I, I'm not making fun of them. I just don't take them too seriously at this point. Uh, and, you know, Selena Vega with her shoe. I, I, I have to say, <laughs> Selena. Nobody's reacting to this outside of Puerto Rico. Nobody. We, we like we we get it. Okay, it's a it's a customary in your uh, in your family or in your in your lineage. Fine. In your country, that's what you do. But, but no one cares here. I know you're trying to add a little wrinkle, and I, I and I really do enjoy Zelina Vega on a lot of levels. I still believe she has a women's title run in her in her future. I do believe that. But just for me as a fan, this is my own opinion. The shoe thing is silly. It, it doesn't feel like it's catching on in the United States or anywhere outside of your home country. It's just sorry it doesn't. Um, but other than that, I mean, you got uh, Cruz del Toro, who's kind of the you know the house plan of the group, doesn't really do much, and Santos Escobar, who is the leader of the group and has consistently put it on putting on really good match after really good match after really good match, and then you have. Uh, Carlito, who has recently joined, and I think he's outside of them changing his music, which I don't like, and I guess Carlito didn't either. Yeah, he adds a nice element to that group too. It does feel like it's getting a little bit too big. <laughs> um, it feels like the group is expanding to a point where it's starting to get watered down a bit. Uh, so I would say this is the cap. Stop. Don't add anyone else. Uh, please stop. Um, but Carlito being added and being back for, I would imagine, a short but consistent run is fun and it's nostalgic and he does look great. And he does so far look like he can go in the ring to the level that he used to. And that's good. And in some ways, I think he looks better than he did 15 years ago. So I have no issue with this group right now, other than the fact, as I said, I don't see them in any serious long term main event story. They'll be in the mid, the upper mid card, and I think that's kind of where they've been capped with the U.S. title picture, and that's cool, pun intended. But I just right now I just I don't see that that's in the cards for them. I, I could be wrong, but they are still building stars, and that's the point of the group. You're building Santos Escobar into a star. Would he have been a bigger star if they stuck around with uh, Legado del Fantasma? Maybe. I actually they, they didn't give that a chance to breathe. I really enjoyed what they had going on there. Kind of this evil mafia, like you know, uh, ethnocentric group. I, I I would have been all about that. And they just didn't have a chance to breathe. And they just suddenly morphed into the LWO because they were going to Puerto Rico for a PLE. And then it caught on and then they kept it. And then Carlito joins and um, here we go. You know, <laughs> so um, it hasn't been a flop by any means. The LWO is getting very solid reactions. Because of star power. And Zelina Vega is a nice touch. So, um, but my point of all this, after I went on 40 tangents, it's a bad habit, guys. I am, I'm, I really apologize. My point with all this with talking about LA Knight is, after his predictable loss to, L, to uh, Roman Reigns at Crown Jewel, you have 
a heel U.S. Uh, champion in Logan Paul for him to chase. That could lead f- into uh, you know Survivor Series. It could lead then into maybe a December televised show, as there's no PLE right now, so they'll have they'll have a PLE type of televised show that'll it'll feel big, uh, as they've done really throughout the year. And so they could still have title match, a title U.S. title match with LA Knight versus Logan Paul. Maybe LA Knight wins there. You know, like that's possible if they don't have any vision or purpose for LA Knight beyond this one big flash in the pan. Let's see how it goes. He's going to lose. but um, And then they, they kick him back to the upper mid card and then let him sit there for a while. But speaking of LA Knight, he interrupted Paul Heyman. And um, that was, first of all, it was a massive reaction. Maybe one of the top pops of the night, if not the top of the night. Good sign for LA Knight as this doesn't seem to be a fad that LA Knight continues to build momentum. And um, LA Knight told Heyman to take a walk as far as he was concerned, and then he wanted Roman Reigns out there right now, which, I mean, if you've been following Roman's career over the last even just one year, you know he, you knew he wasn't there. But then he brings Paul Heyman back into the ring, and uh, he told Heyman that if he stepped one foot out of the ring, he'd knock his hair back to gray, and he told... I followed up and told Heyman that he took issue with him calling it the spear last week, a warning shot, because he's he's like Michael Myers. He'll come back over and over again. And Knight told Heyman to stop and won't stop until he takes the undisputed WWE title from Reigns. And then he would take it from, his, from him as quick as he rose up the ranks on SmackDown. He then told Heyman there would be a contract signing next week, and when he called Reigns, he better be 100% clear about whose game it is. And then uh, he gave the microphone back to... Uh, to, to, to uh, Paul Heyman. So, you know, this continues to be a blessing and a curse for Knight. And what I mean by that is, overall, I thought the segment was effective. I thought it d- did what it set out to do. And that was to get LA Knight in the main event. Don't give too much of LA Knight. Don't give, and that, that's actually one thing I'll give them credit for. They haven't overexposed Knight in, in the way that so many people stars in the past on the rise have suffered of from the WWE machine where they decided to, Oh, something's catching on. Let's give them all of it. And then some, and then it, you know, wears out. It's welcome. And, uh, that they haven't done that with night. They've been careful about how often they've put him out there and that's smart. But where I would continue to say areas for improvement are needed. This isn't going to be a shock. If you guys listened to me before, LA Knight's promos are good, but they're not great, and they need to be great right now. If anyone out there is trying to make a case to management to main event and actually have him win the belt and be the one to take the belt off of Roman, they can't just be good anymore. Good is uh, you know, g- good is the bare minimum. Good is the recipe for staying where you are, not descending, not ascending, but just kind of staying where you're you are. You need to have that standout promo. Not every now, let me be clear. Every promo he has from here on out doesn't need to be blockbuster, doesn't need to be in documentaries or studied or whatever and you know shown in promo class. But he needs to have one of those mixed in with some just good or okay ones. And how he does that is I you know, get away from the silly quip lines about you know, calling people names and punching the gray hair at it back into his head or like, those are funny. I get it. Those can be blended into whatever you're talking about, but they can't be the whole substance of your, of your promo. Do you know what I mean? You know, they're great spices to add to the promo. They're funny. They're, they're, you know, it shows you're self-aware. You, you, you know, you know what's going on that you have some emotional intelligence, but it doesn't like, it doesn't show me who and what you are outside of just like funny, cute lines. I need more substance. I need more real talk from LA Knight. I don't need him going into like promo mode. If, if Does that make sense to you guys? Like he just goes right into like he's cutting a promo instead of you know, and cutting cute lines that he thought of in the back, which are good. That's the thing. They're, they're well delivered. But if you're going to be going from good to great, a case that management cannot deny you need to have that substance, that it factor, 
that grabs the fans emotions not just plays sing along and plays uh you know a part in your promo of the yaz but you're able to grab the heart and soul of the fans with your story with who you are with, you know that's the kind of thing he needs and that's what's been missing i think from taking him from good to great so that's how i think he can improve now to the yeah chance maybe they've taken the place of the what chance is it possible or did I just curse the whole thing <laughs> have the what chance been replaced by yeah like and I could be totally wrong because I'm so numb to the what chance at this point but can anybody tell me the last time what chance totally took over everything since the yeah movement started maybe the yeah movement is its replacement so it's a, it's a, I know that yeah isn't something you can just add in to anybody's promo like the what thing because you have to say LA night first but I, I don't know ever ever maybe that's in my mind so all right where do we want to go next there's a, a couple places Montez Ford beating Santos Escobar I already talked about Santos but good match eight minutes 30 seconds and it uh, ended with Escobar um getting rolled up by Ford with the tights being grabbed. So Montez Ford uh, playing the heel role in a bit of a, a bit of a different outfit, but same music. I would change the music if they want to really so, sell the whole heel thing, but a solid match nonetheless from two superior athletes and uh, the pull of the tights is uh, you know a nice touch to solidify what role that Ford is in, which I have no problem with the Street Profits going heel. We've been talking about this for over a year, year and a half. Many of us is like, can we just do something with them? More than that, maybe even two years. So we got it. All right. So then we got uh, pretty deadly at a spa for a pedicure and the brawling brutes were there and they put their faces in the, uh, the pedicure water, which is gross to think about. But John Cena came out in, in, in other news. So John Cena came out and he was fired up about San Antonio and you know, talked about you know, basically pandering to the crowd as he does. And a, a thank you Cena chant ha- uh, took place and then he thanked them and said he got hit with pretty harsh truths today. And he mentioned speaking about Roman Reigns impressive streak at, as WWE champion and then brought up a streak of his own. And Cena said it had been 2002 days since he won a televised singles match. And he said it was... His last win in tw- it was in 2018, and the crowd cheered, and Cena pushed on and said he had to face reality, that he had been talking about retirement, and said he had to face It's been a long time since he's gotten a win, and the crowd chanted that he still had it, and he said he still believed in himself, that he could go, and thought he could bring it, and said it would be a bad night for the next person that walks down to the ring, and that ended up being Solo Sokoa. Okay. So John Cena teasing retirement is nothing that any of us didn't expect at some point. I mean, we all know it's, it's going to happen one way or another. And John Cena also is right now only scheduled to be through uh, the SmackDown next week. And then he is not scheduled to be on WWE after that. Maybe until WrestleMania season rumble. Maybe he's a surprise rumble entrant or something. So that next week could be the final week that we see Cena on TV for a little while. Now, um, at least on SmackDown. So I have I, I take issue with this. So I, I tweeted this out earlier and because I had a bit I I have a bit of an issue with the numbers he's putting out there. Not that they're wrong, but that they are misleading. So you can lie with numbers. What I mean by that is Mr. Hustle Loyalty and Respect said he had been in a, he hasn't won a singles match, a televised singles match, see that's the qualifier, in two thousand two days. Now, I'll take him at face value. Sure, that's probably true. And he said his last win was in 2018. But let me ask you something. Between uh, 2018 and uh, now, those 2002 days that he is uh, referencing, a couple questions that are pretty relevant to the substantive purpose of these numbers. Number one, um, how many televised matches did you have Exactly. Singles matches between 2018 and now in those 2002 days. And by the way, uh, how many shows did you even come to? And even if you did, 
did you compete in any of them? Right? Like those are pretty important questions. I would venture to guess just ballparking it that in those 2002 days, how many singles matches he's had, you could probably count on one hand. So it's not like he's been full time since 2018. If that was the case, I'm sure that would be a horrendous streak. But he even part time, that would be a horrendous streak. But let's really look at it. How many matches, singles matches, has John Cena had in those 2002 days? Well, I've got numbers for you, folks. You ready for these? Oh, I'm ready. So this is according to cagematch.net, okay? You can go to other sources. Cage Match is a pretty rel- uh, pretty relevant and reliable source for numbers. So this is, just so you know what I searched for, for those of you that want to fact check me, which is fine. I did only broadcasted shows and only singles matches by year. All right. So let's go back to 2018. Now, d- according to this, he had seven matches, six wins in singles matches. That I'm going to chalk up to saying that he, well, he said he only had one loss, but um, I'm going to go with he, th- those came early in the year and he's st- uh, uh, citing stats that came after that. Okay, so let's just take him at face. He had zero matches in 2019. He had one match in 2020. One match in 2021. Zero matches in 2022. And one match in 2023. So let's just pretend 2018 doesn't exist for the simple fact that those numbers of he actually won six Singles matches in 2018 don't exist because they probably came early in the year. Take that out of it. 2019, he had nothing. 2020, he had one. 2021, he had one. He's really, for, since about that time that he's for, uh, referencing, 0-3. Let that sink in. That's a pretty important detail. And I know many of you are sitting there going, why oh, do you have to break this down? No, it's important. Because this is, this is to me, is like lying with numbers. I gave you a detail that has now shifted your view of, oh my God, you're right. He hasn't, he hasn't won since 2018. Well, oh oh my God. Well, this is ridiculous. He should consider retirement given he's gone 0 and 3 in four years. Oh my God. No, he's yeah. That see that, that to me is the, is the biggest question I had. And here are the stats guys, hard numbers. Go look at them yourself. Uh, He's 0 and 3. Retiring, retiring off of 0-3, and, and maybe he has early onset Alzheimer's where he doesn't remember how many matches he had, and he thinks he's had like, you know, 240 matches of which he's 0-240. Outside of that, or selective memory, he's really 0-3. Go look for yourself. Of which, two of those years he didn't even have a match. Singles match. I know he had a tag team. No, no, no. Singles. So um, if you're wondering, by the way, as I was about broadcasted TV singles matches in his entire career, his overall record is 70%. He's had 110 losses, 306 wins and 21 draws. So that's 70% wins, 25% losses and about 5% uh draws or broadways or no D or, you know, whatever they want you, whatever you want to label that as he's had 437 total singles televised matches in his career singles. So there you go, guys, that should kind of shift your thinking about his whole narrative. I know I spent 15 minutes on this, but it was well-deserved because it's easily debunked by anybody or rather not debunked, but more context, very important context added. All right. Let's move. So uh, Solo Sokoa came out and they started brawling. And then Jimmy Uso snuck out, uh, snuck up and landed a super kick, which looked awful, by the way. I mean, it just it's like if I got in there and hit a super kick. It happens, right? It's fine. We, we know what the purpose of it was. Fine. Um, then we got uh, uh, Jay Uso, who dressed up with a mask and hood on and... Uh, leveled Jimmy Uso with that and they brawled and that's when Cena avoided the Samoan spike and hit the AA on solo. 
So that was fun. I really enjoyed that. I think that, uh, you know, even though I'm not looking forward to Jimmy versus Jay, if they want to go to it, let's go to it and get it over with to me. Fine. I'm in, I'm invested, but just barely to me because I, I don't really want to see them fight. Number one. And number two, I'm just tired of intra family bloodline stuff, but fine. If we're going to get to it and get through it, cool. Uh, but this was a uh, fun and also the most important part and best part about this whole thing. John Cena looks strong, which doesn't, hasn't happened in a long time where he gets the last laugh or he's the one victorious or he's the one standing tall. It really is true. It ha- he hasn't done a whole lot in this part of his career, but the argument is, nor should he, he's in the give back portion that is optional that I really commend him for doing. It's he's in the help building the next generation of stars and getting over new talent. Hey, I give him all the credit in the world for doing something he doesn't have to do right now. So there is that. But the best part of all of this was not Solo getting an AA, which was actually enjoyable, but that security actually took Jay Uso out. And then we had the SmackDown general manager come in and fine Jay Uso $10,000. Adam Pierce shows up. And he says, well, if you're going to find Jay, you might as well find Jimmy. And uh, which made no sense because why, why wouldn't, (laughs) why wouldn't, uh, if Nick Aldis can find a guy that's not on his roster, why couldn't Adam Pierce also find Jimmy, Uh, whatever. But that was a great part to respect the brand rules and maybe something that triple H now that he's fully in control, apparently we'll just go with that. Um, that he's fully in control has brought back the respect for their own brand rules and having security chase out people that shouldn't be there. That's great. And, um, the one thing though that got me concerned was when Adam Pierce said these words, let the games begin to Nick Aldis. And what are we right around survivor series? And what happened last year? War games. So the play on words of let the games begin could very well be pointing to war games and even worse, brand supremacy, the manufactured brand rivalry. Oy, oy vey, right? I have zero interest in brand loyalty. I Nobody in WWE, if you're a fan, you don't have brand loyalty. I'm sorry, you don't. You don't have brand loyalty to different. I'm talking about within the same brand. You don't have sub brand loyalty. You just don't. It does not exist in WWE. If you're a WWE fan, you're not sitting there going, I, I don't watch this, this inferior SmackDown. I don't watch raw. I only watch SmackDown or I'm a, I'm blue through and through. I bleed red. Nobody's not find me a fan that would not go if they had free tickets, even to their, quote, opposing show if they had the opportunity. Of course they would. You you do not have brand loyalty, sub-brand loyalty. So we're all supposed to just play pretend that this brand supremacy means anything to anyone outside of the general managers. That's essentially all it means for um, anyone thing to is the GMs. So I really hope that's not what this is leading to, but I'm <laughs> kind of leaning towards, unfortunately, yes. Oy. All right, we got Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. They are uh, in, in some demonic trance at this point, putting spells on everyone in the, in the woods. Uh, I don't know if they are uh, <clears throat> at this point in, the, in the, uh, the calendar year. They're heading towards All Hallows' Eve. Maybe they are, they're casting spells with the Sanderson sisters in Salem. I don't know. Uh, that that's could be what they're doing. And uh, by the way, if you got that reference, we're friends because uh, that means you grew up in the right era. There is, a, by the way, there is a correct era to grow up in, you know. So, <laughs> which, ever, by the way, everybody thinks the 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 uh, generations that they grew up in are like the best. Everyone usually thinks like the music they grew up with is the best, and it's all because it's nostalgic for the most part. Um, you'll find outliers, but generally everyone thinks, oh man, the music isn't what it used to be. I like, you know, th- my generation right now is listening to '90s music. In early 2000s, and we all think it's the best. But this generation will look back in 15, 20 years and go, oh, remember the 2020s? That was such great music. That's the way it goes. Um, all right. I think spells on every tag team in the division. So, 
Uh, you're right. I guess it's that time of year. Okay, Cameron Grimes and Dragon Lee versus Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. Grayson Waller and Austin Theory took out Dragon Lee and Cameron Grimes in six minutes. They needed this victory. Uh, Waller hit a rolling stunner, and then Theory hit A-Town down on, um, uh, was it Lee? And No, I'm sorry, Grimes, and got the victory. And that was needed. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, it was Lee. Dragon Lee, well, Dragon Lee losing is, is a big problem for me because he had a great match a couple of weeks ago. He just got introduced. Give him time to get some victories. At the same time, Theory and Waller also need victories. Badly. So, yeah, I, I actually see both sides. The tag team division as a whole, though, always needs help. Always. Kevin Owens was interviewed by Kathy Kelly. He spoke about his uh, disappointment of getting separated from Sammy. And they, they, they never got a uh, proper rematch for the tag titles. And Kevin uh, called out never having a match with Rey Mysterio or Sheamus and said there were a lot of new faces for him to punch. And that was pretty much it. So saying he's sad but gets to work with new guys. That's kind of it. On a side note, though, by the way, I'm, I'm glad that WWE has seemingly maybe landed on one singular belt for Roman. I didn't see Paul carrying two last week. And that we're just going to call it the Undisputed WWE Championship. I think we might have landed on that. All right. I already talked about EO and Charlotte and uh, the return of Bianca. So that, that sums it up. Let me quickly run through Raw and then I'll get to the voicemails and stuff. So um, on Monday Night Raw, if you forgot, we got a new tag team champions. Oh, yes, we did. Or I, I would do the, the uh, Paul Bearer voice, but I can't. You guys know what I'm talking about. The oh, yes. Think about that. We do, and the judgment day, the judgment day now have the tag titles back in a shocking, uh, very short run of Jimmy, or rather Jay and Cody. So we're going to see what leads to that. Um, I, I myself was very surprised that they dropped them so quickly, but um, <clears throat> we also got Bronson Reed versus Gunther, in which Bronson Reed had a great outing for at least this point of his career in a big match with Gunther. And Gunther retains as he should clean. So that was nice to see. Uh, we had uh, Shinsuke versus Ricochet and probably the match of the night. Really good match. That was about 14 minutes in a falls count anywhere. <clears throat> this was a lot of fun. Uh, Shinsuke, you know, even out of the title picture now with Seth continues to show what he can do in the ring. And I loved it. Natalia versus Piper Niven. Piper Niven beat Natalia in six minutes. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we got uh, Seth Rollins and another show uh, showdown with Drew face-to-face. And uh, then uh, we got, let's see, Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci uh, because they t- he took on Johnny Gargano. And Johnny Gargano ended up losing to Ludwig Kaiser in exact limits. We got... Women's world title or women's world champion Rhea Ripley versus Shayna in a non title match in which Rhea Ripley won. And, uh, uh, or rather, she fought Baszler to a no contest, I'm sorry, in five minutes. We also got, uh, let's see, a lot of backstage interview stuff, but the Gunther Bronson Reed, as I said, happened already. And then the, uh, tag team title match. So I know I'm breezing over Raw. A lot more happened on Raw with backstage segments and all that shen- all the shenanigans that go with it. But I will say that uh, we're about to get into those emails, guys. So let's dive into the emails that we missed from the mailbag last week. And then the voicemails and we'll wrap up the show. So uh, let's see who's up first. All right. This is uh, Jaden. This is a part two to uh, the image that was sent. I remember that. So Jaden says... Hey, Matt, I sent an image last week with some stats comparing the championship reigns between Hogan and Reigns, and I included text, but it didn't send with the image, so here's what I wrote. Okay, cool. Long-time listener, but first-time writer, <clears throat> and sorry, this may be a little long. I came across this graphic while scrolling through Facebook, and the difference in title defenses is just insane, 79 to 29. With a little less than a year's difference in total number of days between these two reigns, Hogan had 50 more title defenses. Almost half of Roman's title defenses came in 2021, where he had 13, which is just one year 
in now with uh, with the now over three year reign. And as a fan, that's not gonna work gonna work for me, brother. To put it in modern day perspective, Creative typically tries to push out one PLE a month, and with Hogan holding 50 more title defenses, that's over four years worth of missed opportunities in PLE level matches and storyline potential because of WWE's decision to make him a proper champion. I'm sure Roman also holds the title or control in his contract, so almost undoubtedly, he's at least partially to blame as well. It's without a doubt that this title reign alone is going to be enough for WWE to push him to the Hall of Fame, so I think he's going to be interesting to see how fans react when it comes to do, comes time to do so after facts like these continue to come out. If you take this proper or this paper championship away from him, apart from the Shield run, what does he really have to stand from him and the rest of the pack? Some universally hated runs because he was skyrocketed to the top of the card, despite WWE uh, the WWE fans making it blatantly obvious that we didn't want to cheer him. Of course, the Mania win against Taker was worth mentioning, but Brock being the one to break the streak and not Taker, um, yeah, not retiring after a loss potentially strips the shock of that moment for me. Well, yeah, I mean, you strip away the Shield, it's it's tough. You strip away the Shield and this run, yeah, I mean, like really, that'd be a much tougher case to sell. As far as Roman going to the Hall of Fame, it would be absolutely. I, the, the Taker victory, I will say, though, that match was bad. I was there live for it in Orlando. Uh, even Taker has admitted it was a bad match. He was embarrassed by it. It wasn't great. A lot of botches. Taker was out of shape, and he admitted it. So I'm not saying anything he didn't already say. And yeah, Taker didn't want to go out like that, which is why he returned. But I wouldn't really put that on his uh, resume. But this title reign uh, with Roman, he, I wouldn't call him a paper champion, but I would call him an inflated champion because the number of days have just been egregiously inflated because of his absences that are just re- insane at this point. Like, that's not even funny. It's not even like, it's just like, it's, it's frustrating as a fan and it's got to be even more frustrating if you're an actual talent on SmackDown. But, um, Yeah. So as far as, oh, you have more here. So I heard Paul Heyman say at a press conference that anyone who complains about the length of the bloodline storyline is just ignorant. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Part of a good story is knowing when to end it, and they've pushed past that. Personally, I think they should have ended the story with either Drew at Clash at the Castle or Sammy at Chamber. So when do you think they should have ended the story, and what do you think would the optimal choice for the belt being dropped in the future? Also, if they inevitably give the belt to the baby kisser Cody Rhodes after passing on the opportunity to drop it to Drew in Wales and Sammy in Montreal, I just may have the have to drive to Connecticut to kick Vince and Triple H in the nuts myself. Well, Vince, you may not see, but yeah, Triple H. Triple H should be a little bit more of a sell I, or a tough guy to, to do that to. I, I wouldn't, but um, all right. I, I don't agree with what Paul Heyman said there. I mean, anyone he said anyone who complains about the length of the bloodline story is just ignorant. Well, I'd, I'd love to have him elaborate on that just very ge- general statement, very, very kind of like broad statement. So, Paul, are you just going to say like th- this match or this storyline should just go on indefinitely? Why? <laughs> like, I don't care how good the story is. It naturally will come to an end. And the length is something that is a problem. Yes. And I don't know if it's really the length of the bloodline storyline itself versus the length of how long Roman Reigns has held the belt and how few times he's there, which is an, that to me is a much larger complaint than, Oh, the bloodline still has a story going on. Not that if the storyline's engaging and it has, it was for such a long time and they did consistently do good writing. Fine. But when you you know you 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 hold a title captive and hostage, that's the part that I take issue with. Um, yeah. But as far as when would I have ended it? I mean, I don't even have to think twice. Sammy at Chamber. I don't regret. I still don't. All these months later, still believe that was the right time. It wasn't just in Montreal where he had support. Sami Zayn had worldwide support. Sure, it was the hottest in Montreal for obvious reasons. But it would have been a magical place to do it, the perfect place to do it. The storyline was just absolutely pristine. The, uh, the the chemistry that Kevin Owens, or rather Sammy and Roman had on camera was perfect. Uh, you know, th- th- it was just all it all lined up. 
It all lined up in a way that never, ever happens. Well, I shouldn't say no. Extremely rarely does something like that fall into your lap. And they said, no, we've got a better idea. Well, what exactly is that idea? Where, where is this magical idea that supersedes Sammy and Roman Reigns in Montreal after coming off one of the hottest storylines in years? Where exa- where, where's that storyline? I'm still looking out on the horizon. I can't see anything. Yeah. Um, but I, I believe it, unfortunately, will be Cody at this point. All right. Let's continue. And thank you so much, Jaden. And let's get to Anthony. And he says, good morning from California. Uh, wanted to drop a line about The Rock. I strongly believe he is not going to be at WrestleMania 40. That's why I refer to him showing up as an appearance and not a return. The Rock's story about not being able to find a good ending and a beginning from him wrestling Roman was a weak excuse. He built that up to make it seem like they were so, so close, and I don't believe that to be true. He said in his comments, he and the rest of the group in the discussion were talking about it, and the tequila came out and blah, blah, blah. To me, this is just a bunch of guys sitting around drinking and BSing with no real intention of follow through. Shame on The Rock for getting people's hopes up. LA Knight has won me over. I was on the fence because of how much he mimics the Attitude Era. Um, uh, I know, I know, I know if it works, it works. But seeing Knight go toe to toe with Roman on the promo and just seeing he's absolutely taking it all in and appreciating his ascent has me saying LA Knight. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Side note, thinking about your listener in Israel, Sharon. Looking forward to having your convo with him and hope his family is safe. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And uh, Sharon, I um, I will get back to you shortly. I'm trying to come up with a time, too. I know our time difference is seven hours, and we will uh, we'll work it out. Because the time that you propose on Thursdays is a time that uh, doesn't work. So we'll talk. I'll email you on the on the. Uh, on, on the side and we'll figure out a time, but, uh, yeah, we're all thinking about you, Sharon. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an insane time to live, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. So, all right. Now the rock, let me just say this before we all get in a tizzy and we all say, Oh my God, now the reports are the opposite. The rock's not going to be there. Let's wait till that happens. Because let me just say this. If it does happen that the rock is not going to be there and he is not doing WrestleMania 40 this year. Uh, I've said this before and I will say it again. I I'm, I don't want to hear about it ever again. I have no interest in the rock and Roman after this because, and really like you said, shame on everyone involved for if they purposefully tease this, I mean, I don't, I don't think the fans really look at this and go, oh man, well, I hope the rock faces Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 40, but I only want to see it. If the rock does something different, I only want to see it. If the rock doesn't just end something, he starts something. No fan, nowhere, anywhere is saying that it's only the rock. And, And I just, I, that will be, that actually may turn the rock heel. I mean, like in for real, imagine this doesn't happen, right? Imagine this doesn't happen, which just seems like it's a strong chance. And then all of a sudden, uh, the rock shows up like a month after WrestleMania, he might get booed and he should like shame on everybody. If this doesn't happen, everyone that has a hand in this from Dwayne to Vince, because he was involved with this before he left to Triple H, to everyone that had a hand in this. Shame on all of you if this doesn't happen. Of course, it's really mostly on The Rock because he's the one that gets to kind of pick, choose, and he's at the point in his career he can just call the shots. So that would be awful. So, all right. I know. All right, let's move on before I keep ranting. All righty. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, this is from Bad Fish. He says, hey, WWE Podcast fam. Bad Fish here. Just watched SmackDown, and I think the build of Survivor Series has begun. I have a couple of predictions. Either Brand versus Brand do the interjection <coughs> between uh, Adam Pierce and Aldis. And the way they could go is Team Jimmy versus Team J, which eventually leads to a match between the two. It could. Yes, that could happen. Absolutely. Last prediction is Cena faces the winner between Seth and Drew the night after Raw, right after on Raw, wins the belt, gets the record, and then retires. 
What are your thoughts on these? Thanks for the dope content. Until next time, bad fish out. Well, so I, your first prediction about Team Jimmy versus Team Team Jimmy versus Team J is much more likely than your second scenario for uh, <clears throat> Cena facing the winner between Seth and Drew the night after on Raw because who does that help? Like you're you're building a nice program with Seth and Drew right now. To have Cena win it and go, okay, well, I got what I needed. Uh, you, you guys do what you want, but now I'll vacate the title. That's who does that help? That that hurts both Rollins and Drew because neither are now champion. It disrespects the championship because Cena gets something that we're told is the top prize on Raw, and then goes, oh well, I only wanted it for my selfish reasons of getting to the 16th championship, and now uh, uh, peace out, guys. Uh, it doesn't look good for anybody. So I very much doubt I understand what you mean. Um, I don't mind John Cena getting to that number. Charlotte Flair is also on the women's side of things very close to. I don't mind that, but I don't want it to be a joke of a run or a two-week run or a one-day run. I need it to be substantial just to respect the championship and not have John Cena literally. I mean, that would be just viewed as selfish. It just would. All right. So uh, thank you, buddy. Let me see if I have any more emails. I might not. It might be just those few voicemails. Let's take a look. Hey, Matt and WWE Podcast. Hope all is well with everyone. Uh, but Matt and uh, and Anthony, as a matter of fact, I'm going to call you both out on something. Um, you know, the gig is out. You know, I'm going to I'm going to break this to uh, to the audience. Uh, the real deal is, you know what? We know that both you and Anthony are really tight friends with. Cody Rhodes. You guys go out drinking together. You play pool together. You know, the, the gig is up, my friends. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to break it to all of your loyal fans, but, you know, I, I just couldn't let it slide any longer. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> to get a little bit serious, um, I, too, find Cody Rhodes insufferable. I'm Obviously, that was a joke, but... Um, I have an answer or maybe a suggestion to all of the WWE podcast family on what someone called in last week about on when Cody says, so what do you want to talk about and how the fans can get in unison and actually give them an answer. And Matt, you said, obviously the, that's great to uh, come rot that, but uh, how are you going to get 14,000 people to do that? But what's the 14,000 people all day all at once so what do you want to talk about what how awesome would that be if the whole crowd just whated Cody Rhodes now I agree with you Matt when you say the what chance are just uh, they've run their course way too far and uh, I can't stand to hear it when the crowd does it because like you say they take things into their own hands and take over the show but This is the one exception to the rule. What do you want to talk about? What? What would he do? What would he say? He would be dumbfounded. He would would be lost. So, you know, that's that's, that's my answer to it. But uh, finally, one last thought. Can you and uh, Anthony use your your connections with Cody so he can pull some strings? And please get Pat McAfee and DJ Kuzmo on the same announcement team on SmackDown, can you imagine the the energy that the two of them would bring on a commentary team? DJ Kuzmo and Pat McAfee on one team on SmackDown. That would be absolutely fantastic. The ratings would skyrocket. So that's all I got to say, Matt. Well, I'm out of here. What do you got to say about that? What do you want to talk about? All right. Well, uh, I had to listen back to your voicemail just to see if you left a name and you didn't. So uh, I I don't know how to address you other than to say uh, I thought that that was secret. Okay, that that um, I don't know where you heard that or who you heard that from, but I will find out that information about our personal relationship with Cody was supposed to remain private uh, that we actually, you know, we're buddies. And um, actually, I think I'm hanging out with him. Hey, well, you you already let the cat out of the bag, Um, you know. We're going to go get our hair you know, dyed together, and we're going to get our teeth whitened. I might get a, another tight-fitting suit, you know, uh, but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I can't hold it in any longer. Anthony and I just, we cannot get enough of Cody Rhodes. So, yeah, that's uh, that's actually what we do on our days off. So all weekend we've been with Cody and listening to his stories. And he, he actually let out a really, a massive revelation. I don't know if you guys know this. He let us know, get this, that his dad was a former wrestler and not just any former wrestler. His dad is none other than Dusty Rhodes. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. So you, you, if you think I'm kidding, Google it. That's how fascinating his life is and uh, how important he is. And he also let me know that he's here to make me happy. So that made me feel good inside because I was worried that he was there for selfish reasons and then he was there to like finish us some kind of weird story. No, he's here to make me, make me happy and you guys. That's what he let me know in our personal discussions. Um, but, but, um, so, all right, that is a, by the way, that is a really perfect response to Cody's question. Now, will the fans do this? No, because they are times just, uh, blinded by Cody's song, you know, and, and they're just blinded by that. He's, he's such a good guy and you know, all this stuff. I, I think that eventually when the fans turn on him and I hope they do organically and then Cody's sitting there like befuddled as to. I don't, I don't get it. I was so nice to them. I told them I'd do everything for them. And they, 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 why do they hate me? I really hope this happens somehow organically. And the fans just say, what? That's all through it like a goof. That's probably what it'll do as a baby face. Just, just smile. Like, oh, you, you guys are a rowdy bunch tonight. And then a stupid chiclet smile. And that's, that's how it got through it. But if it consistently happens, oh man. You're making you you're making me too happy, but I agree. I'm setting out the the bulletin, guys. If you are attending a Cody Rhodes uh, appearance, if you're going to Raw, this is how you must respond properly when he asks what we want to talk about. You say what exactly? All right, perfect. All righty. So Pat McAfee and DJ Kuzmo. I mean. I don't know if the if Fox executives can handle that. <laughs> that would be, if you're not excited about, uh, you know, watching or listening to them, if you're not excited, if they don't get you excited, you're not human. I'd agree. All right, here we go. Next voicemail. Hey, it's Kyle from Baltimore. So I wanted to talk about last night's Raw and overall. That was really good, a good Raw. Um, really, really um, hyped up the women's division, really focus on the women's division a lot last night, which was great. Um and you had the you know, the they teased Becky and Rhea again. It's like that match needs to be the WrestleMania main event next year or on WrestleMania Saturday. It needs to be the main event of WrestleMania. I uh, just that match needs to happen. Hopefully that is the main event for WrestleMania next year because it needs to be that. Um so I enjoyed I enjoyed the the confrontation between well the face off between Becky and Rhea that really was great. The indie Becky uh, same for next week as well. That should be fun. And Becky and, and Zia Lee, that was fun too. And, and also, Becky can face to face, face with Jay, just like how Jay can face to face with um, Charlotte on Friday. So, all of these teases with the women's division on Raw gets me more excited and more invested in what's happening on Raw than, than, than on SmackDown right now, currently. So, uh, well, we get to your takes on that, on the face off between Rhea and Becky and Rhea and, and Jade and and do you think that Becky and Rhea is almost is should happen for WrestleMania um, in the main event for WrestleMania next year? Because I think it, it should be. So um, that's my quick thoughts on Raw and on, in the women's division, really just involving Becky, really. But uh, that's it. Thanks for call. Bye. Yeah, Kyle. You know the women's division on Raw did seem to get a bit of a boost, and this coming week. You know, we have Becky Lynch on Raw, even though she's the NXT Women's Champion and she's showcasing it and bringing in new talent and helping elevate new talent. It's all great. It's 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 great, and I'm sure she's having a blast doing it. You know, better than the Trish program, which was other than the final match, just kind of a womp womp. Sadly, I'm not poking fun at it. It just was not an interesting program because it lasted too long and for a lot of reasons. But this, with uh, your, your proposal with Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch for WrestleMania, bring it on. I think that to me is a WrestleMania worthy match. Now you could really pair Rhea Ripley with anybody and have it be a WrestleMania match. She's she has so many women she hasn't faced yet. Obviously Jade Cargill. You have 
uh, Becky Lynch. You have Bianca Belair that she hasn't faced yet. You hell, you even have uh, Bailey. And not, I mean, that's a way outside chance. But my point is, you have a lot of women that you could pair Rhea Ripley with, and a lot of that is because she hasn't even she's done nothing to defend it. Now, nothing is a little strong, but she hasn't defended it in a way that you'd expect her to. She's been more interested in Judgment Day with the but the boys are doing stuff. She's had some up until recently. Up until recently, she hasn't had really serious contenders, and. She's been dominant, but barely defending it. So how can you say someone's dominant if they're not really defending the belt? Kind of difficult. But that said, Becky Lynch, Rhea Ripley, sure. Do I think they're going to go there? Why not? They could. Uh, Becky Lynch, Rhea Ripley is an absolute um, pay-per-view quality main event match. Yes. And I think we'll see the cue of whenever Becky drops that NXT belt of kind of telling us, okay, she's ready to move back to the main roster full-time, and it could be after Rhea wraps up what... So, thanks, Kyle. Hey, this is Jay Miles Miller from Oregon. I want to talk a little bit about L.A. Night, yeah. Uh, but first, a little backstory. Me and my kids, we've been watching WWE since WrestleMania this past year. Um, you know, I graduated from high school back in 95, so I was big into WWE in middle school, so, you know, late 80s early 90s, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior era, um, and then just uh, stopped watching when I got a little older. So about 30 years later, now I got a, a sixth grader and a fifth grader and a second grader at home, the perfect age for this uh, PG era of WWE, um, and just happened to be on Peacock one day. Uh, it happened to be the day of WrestleMania and saw, wow, look, we get uh, – we get WrestleMania for free, and so turned it on with the boys, and it was the actually the last match of the night. We saw Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns um, and started watching, and we started watching every episode of SmackDown and Raw and all the uh, pay-per-views or PLEs. Anyway, I uh, saw this guy, L.A. Knight, uh, in a promo uh, with The New Day, and he smashed a video game controller, and I was like, this is stupid. Who is this guy? And didn't really dig into him. Uh, but then one day I was asking my kids, we were about two or three months into watching WWE, who who are your favorite wrestlers? And uh, the youngest was like, oh, I like Cody Rhodes, I like uh, Seth, and I like L.A. Knight. And I was like, L.A. Knight? Why do you like that guy? Oh, I don't know, I just like him. And uh, all the other boys liked L.A. Knight too. And, you know, here we go. They spotted, uh, <laughs> spotted it before me. Anyway, now we're all big L.A. Knight fans. Uh, we've got uh, some L.A. Knight wristbands on the way. I'm buying the merch, just like WWE wants us. But one thing I did want to say is in that uh, L.A. Knight versus uh, solo match at SmackDown, it seems like L.A. Knight kept putting his hands over his mouth and trying to talk to Solo. At one point, he talked to the referee. I was wondering, uh, Matt, if you could kind of discuss that with uh, wrestlers, talking is that kind of not great uh, when we can see that on camera you know i know they need to communicate as they perform but uh, if, i don't know if you could talk about that is la Knight just still a little green even though uh they're trying to pump him up anyway love the show thank you hey jay if i believe that's the first time i've heard you so welcome and i hope things are going well over there in oregon and it's awesome that you have your kids getting involved with you. I'm, I'm getting close to that age myself with my kid. Well, one of them's five, the other one's two. So I can start indoctrinating my five-year-old into the WWE cult soon. But the PG, see, that's the benefit. A lot of people complain, oh, it's TV, you know, with TV 14, it'd be so much better with blood and guts and sex. And it's like, yeah, well, if, you know, there might be a niche of the audience, like the male 18 to 40 demo that carried WWE for so long that would love that. Uh, and feels that that wouldn't help improve the product. But then you have, you're alienating a lot of your audience that grew up in that time that now have kids that can't and won't allow their kids to watch the product that, you know, if that, if it was at that level. So WWE is smart in that respect. Now, um, so that's cool. Now you guys just started watching or you just started watching again after 30 years. That's so crazy. Uh, because you said you uh, graduated in 95, um, 2003. So I'm not too far behind you. You're so you're 46. Um, I'm 38. And so that certainly uh, is around the same time. If you, you know, you're in the, the mid nineties though, it was kind of 
transitioning into the Attitude Era, you were a year or two away from the Attitude Era, really starting with Vince McMahon and and all that, the Austin and Rock and all that stuff. So uh, you still, you know, you still had a decent time with you know Hulkamania, I would imagine, and that kind of thing, and watching the birth of WCW. Um, so you guys have graduated, or your kids have gravitated towards. LA night. They have suddenly picked out the star. They knew before you knew. <laughs> that's oh, uh, that's crazy. Maybe you should pay attention. We should pay attention to your kids. Start reporting on us. Like who who are they seeing and the, that they really like? Because not too many people. When LA Knight was smashing video of game controllers, we're saying, oh man, that guy's gonna be beat. That guy could potentially beat Roman Reigns for the belt. Yeah, you know, not too many. You know, so uh, maybe your kids are, are, are. I don't know. Maybe they have some kind of ability. That we don't know about. So keep us informed because the rest of us didn't see that coming. Now, LA Knight is no no um, amateur, though. The dude's 40 years old. Okay. He's been in many other independent promotions. This is not his first rodeo. Uh, so he was in TNA for a long time. His He's got a history of cutting really good promos. And as far as him calling matches in the ring and covering his mouth, you know... That to me, I actually didn't pick up on that. Maybe because I'm immune to it. And I've been watching since 1997 straight. Like, I don't know if I've missed a televised show. That could just be me being numb to it and you being more observing of that because you haven't watched in so long. But that's, you know, every guy has their own way of doing that and communicating and talking during a match. Some do it more often. If you have a very familiar opponent, you're not going to communicate with them on every single maneuver. It may be just kind of like you know it's coming, so you don't need to talk. But it's also a different different product now because you have, unlike when you watched you know, in 95, high-definition de- cameras that catch everything. Uh, you have the entire ring mic'd up. You can hear every little thing, so the wrestlers need to be even more careful about when they're communicating. Um, you know, I, but you know what? I, I've even heard Triple H at times during his heyday call a, a spot and you hear it like uh, duck down, uh, like a leapfrog clothesline. And then the next thing is a leapfrog and clothesline. Like you hear it once in a while. It, it's something that's going to slip through with the thousands of maneuvers they do over their career. It's going to slip. Um, I haven't noticed that with LA Knight though, calling his shots. Um, a lot of guys will just look like they're trash talking with their mannerisms, but they're actually calling a spot. So you got to make it look like you're not working with them and you're trash talking, but what you're actually saying is like, Hey, uh, here's what we're doing next. So there's lots of ways to cover it, but, um, I did not notice that was solo. So, all right, let's get to our next voicemail. Alex, the France guy here, your current European champion. I wanted to talk today about wrestling psychology and on why I think uh, WWE can make Cody Rhodes relevant for everybody. Because now Cody Rhodes is really appreciated by a lot of people in the WWE universe. But realistically, a lot of people here on the show, me included, are not convinced about the Cody Rhodes baby face tire. The reason being, in my opinion, is that Cody Rhodes didn't deserve, didn't deserve the title shots, the treatment, the the face treatment, everything. That's the problem with the Cody Rhodes gimmick, the baby face gimmick. It's that he didn't deserve anything. And that's the problem. He needs to get into trouble. He needs to get into losses. He needs to get beaten up just like this raw by Damien Priest, but even further, he needs to lose. He lost the tag titles, but that's not enough. He needs to put in the test. That's the absolutely of a hero story. He needs to put in that being in the trouble doesn't count. It doesn't count. It can become a multiplier in the sentiment, in the feeling of him being a babyface. But first, he needs to get into the test, not uh, not fight the boss at the very beginning of the story. He needs to get beaten up, just like Daniel Bryan, just like John Cena, just like every relevant babyface. 
I don't know, storyline-wise or either by corporate company still being beaten up. I think you understand my point, and I think after that, Cody Rhodes will be one of the most relevant baby face ever. That's all for me for this week, guys. See you next week. Yeah, Alex, you bring up a good point, man. Yeah, this is something that Cody has not experienced yet. And and but the thing is, while you and I agree, and maybe the people that listen to this show agree, you hear the reaction every week. The reaction continues to be very positive. I've seen no sign yet of of the crowd turning on Cody. And maybe they're just still hypnotized by his entrance music and they haven't come out of that fog yet. But eventually they will, and they'll see this guy and go all right, great in ring in, in ring wrestler, very good on the microphone. He's got a, a presence about him. He is a star. All of that's true objectively. I mean, I don't care if you love him or hate him. Like I, you know, I, I hate his baby his character, but I can objectively say he's a star and acknowledge his talents at the same time. But you're right. His babyface character has a lot of flaws that are being covered up by a shiny suit and a good name, which is, of course, the Rhodes name. And all of a sudden, he just comes back, and we're all just supposed to, we, we just blindly accept that he's a massive star. That is something I, I, I don't know why. Because he's the first person to come back from AEW that had a big name. He wasn't a star when he left. I mean, he was a star dust, but he wasn't a star. And he comes back, and all of a sudden, we just accept that he's in the main event of WrestleMania. We just accept that he's number 30 in the Rumble and wins it. What? Yeah, and, and then he just, he wins match after match. And sure, he won, he lost a Brock Lesnar match. Sure. He won the war on that. Fine. He got beat up a little bit by Brock, but he ended up winning the war. And then he takes Roman Reigns to WrestleMania and would have beaten him had it not been for Solo. Like, we're just supposed to accept he's automatically a WrestleMania main eventer? That he can beat anyone? Mr. Squeaky Clean, you're right. And when you said get into trouble, I know what you mean by losses. What I actually was thinking was he needs to get into trouble by like showing an edge. If you want to change this babyface character from a just from a, a lot of the males of 18 to 40 looking at this going, this guy is like, he's not a real person. He's a politician, as I've said, which is exactly the perfect way to describe him. And. He's smiling, always squeaky clean, great smile. His hair is done just so. He's very coordinated and methodical of his music. He's very self-aware of his music. Um, he's just you're always telling us how he's here to make us happy. I mean, throw up a little bit, guys. Please. I just, you know, so all of that. What I was thinking was like, add an edge, get angry. Do something a little bit off the cuff. Stop being Mr. Mor- um, Mr. Morality. He's telling you, oh, well, Jay deserves a second chance. And all of a sudden he has the political power to bring Jay to Raw. And, and then he's the one responsible for, for Kevin Owens going to SmackDown. Like, what, what's going on? I don't know. The fans need to wake up. But they won't. They'll sit in their slumber and keep saying their woes. And... uh Cody will keep asking them what they want to talk about. Thanks, Alex. All right, a couple more. Hey, man. <clears throat> Sorry. Hey, man, it's Justin from Maryland. Hope everyone's doing well. Just want to get my thoughts on a couple of topics. So first is, um, so we've got Logan Paul and Rey Mysterio coming up at Crown Jewel. I'm really hoping that they don't give Rey the belt. Um, I'm sorry, Rey. I said Rey. Logan Paul. I hope they don't give Logan Paul the belt. Um, I don't... I don't recall hearing your thoughts on this program coming up, but I really hope they don't have Logan Paul win. I thought they was going to go the route with Lashley and Ray, but I guess they're doing Lashley and Carlito. So just hoping that um, Ray retains. I mean, we're going to get a good match and all that, but I don't think Logan Paul is the right person to beat Ray. He's not full-time, and, I mean, this is Logan Paul. I mean, he's going to give us, you know, like if he won, It'll, it'll definitely bring him big heat, but I just don't think he's the right guy. Next, so I was definitely surprised at the uh, the tag title change on Raw. I missed it, but when I saw it, I was just like, wow, they lost. Like, they just won it. 
And I thought that they were going to somehow set up Cody, uh, Cody and Jay against uh, Jimmy and Solo. But we got the Judgment Day uh, champions again. So I'm guessing they're going to do Jimmy and Jay. I don't even know. I mean, I don't think Crown Jewel is the right time because Jay's on Raw. But Jimmy was on Raw. He's on SmackDown. So I don't know. Um, I'm just surprised that they won. And I'm just interested to see, like, where they're going to go with the tag titles. Because it seems like they're setting up war games with with uh, the Judgment Day and the Bloodline against Jimmy and, I'm sorry, against Jay, Cody, and other people. But I'm just interested to see where they're going to go as far as, you know, like, who their opponents are going to be next. Um, so finally, um, so we're getting Roman and LA Knight. I thought they were going to go with Cena and Roman one more time, but I guess LA Knight, um, it's his, his time basically. I don't see him winning. Um, I think we're going to get a, a decent match, probably get a screwy finish, but it's good to see LA Knight getting, you know, the spotlight right now. He's definitely over, but I don't see him winning right now. Um, Heard that we're getting Randy Orton coming back soon, probably by Survivor Series. So I don't think LA Knight is the right guy right now to win. But it's good that he's getting this disposal. So that would be cool. Um, and then Gunther, I'm interested to see who, who uh, Gunther is going to find next. Um, because I don't, like I said, there's no one on the roster right now that, that should be him. Like I think the person who's going to be him is probably going to come up from NXT because I don't think anybody on the roster is. All right there, Justin. Good to hear from you, man. And so a couple of points. You mentioned Logan Paul's not the right guy. And I went over this earlier in the show. He might not be from the logical perspective of, well, he's not there that much. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't had what, but six matches on the, on the card or on the uh, WWE television. But the crowd reacts to him. He puts on really good matches. I'm not a Logan Paul defender or apologist. I have no love loss for, for Logan Paul as a person. As a wrestler? The guy's got it, and the crowd hates him, and he's easily unlikable. And what you could do with the heel, heel champions are always, as a rule of thumb, better because it helps build baby faces up to take the ba- the heel down. You want to see somebody rise up. When a baby face is at the top, it's like, oh, no, huh, I hope none of these heels take it. It's harder to build a heel as a star when you're trying to take down a baby face instead of a baby face coming around and trying to take down a heel as a champion. So... And the storytelling is usually better. So while he might not be the quote unquote the right guy, if you look at it through the lens of, okay, well, if he's there to just help build new stars too, I mean, Logan Paul is still in the building star phase himself. But if the idea is to, for the belt, help build LA Knight into a single star, then him winning the US title in the interim could be fun. Him, a program with Logan Paul and LA Knight could be fun. Um, Because... Let's face it, Rey Mysterio doesn't need the belt. You know, Rey Mysterio right now is not really in a position to hold the belt for a long period of time because that's not it's not going to help or hurt his career. It's just kind of there. You know, if he continues to face against off against young talent to help build new stars, I'm all with it. All right. Uh, now, your other point about Gunther, who's next? Good question. I, I don't know. I mean, you, you could... No, I would say Randy Orton, but I've I've placed Randy Orton in like eight different scenarios. Probably not Randy Orton. Um, I mean, again, you could have LA Knight be traded to Raw and challenge Gunther. You could have another Chad Gable uh, program with Gunther. You could have Bronson Reed Part 2. You could have, uh, you know, Ricochet again, I guess. You know, there are several ways to go, but you're right. It could be somebody and should be somebody from the, the NXT roster. Maybe maybe a, a Braun Breaker. How many times have all of us fantasized or fantasy booked, rather, him coming up to the main roster for several different scenarios? So, sure. Uh, you know, the, the, the NXT guys are probably more likely because I don't know who faces him that he hasn't already faced and beaten. All right. Final voicemail. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one and only the Gardner Michael Gross. Uh, you are person who's on Russell Magic, your co-host, Captain King, whatever you want to call him. And uh, just on behalf of me and my, my team, I want to say happy anniversary to us for three years on the, the, the mailbag. 
And I also want to say that Russell Magic has a lot of irons in the fire. You all obviously know about that. For people who don't know about my absence for a long time, it's because I had to t- take a lot of time to fall in love with a woman named Jennifer, and it just makes me happy. And um, I hope that you're happy, Matt, and I hope you're doing well with Mosher and Thrasher, your kids. And, um, you know, on behalf of uh, just incredible PJ Colaco, who also wishes us the, the same things, uh, I just love everybody. I love the show. And uh, go L.A. night. Thank you. Goodbye. All right, Michael. Well, thank you so much. Good to hear from you. And, uh, yeah, never a bad time to take time away and uh, to focus on things that matter. So, But, uh, yeah, the headbangers are doing well, keeping me exhausted, as always. Uh, I'm sitting here nearly midnight right now, and I'm trying to end the show. <laughs> Not that you're keeping me up. Just uh, I, need to, I need to hit the hay. Um, but good to hear from you. I hope we talk soon and that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you also reminded me about the three year anniversary. Somebody else did too. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Three, not three anniversary of the show. I mean, I've been doing podcasting for nearly nine years. Um, actually it'll be 10 years. I think this February that I've been doing podcasting generally, uh, maybe what I'll do. And I said this to the patrons earlier, this year that maybe I'll release one of my earliest episodes when I, my podcast was under another name, but I can't promise you won't get secondhand embarrassment. Uh, there's no promises. You listen to this and go, is he being a parody of himself? Right. It, it, it's so embarrassing. I don't know if I can release it because then it's out in the world and it'll never, it'll never uh, go away. I've kind of locked them in a vault and let their, their corpses rot is what I've done. The, the figurative corpses of my old podcast rot. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. Maybe if I have a few beers one night and I'm feeling good, I release it. And then in the morning I'll wake up and go, what the hell did I just do? Yeah, that's probably what I'll do. Have some post regret. <laughs> Let the alcohol make the decision for me. That's always a good way to live. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you, Michael. Hope you're doing well. And uh, thank you to everybody who called in. And I, I apologize for not getting everyone's emails and voicemails out in the mailbag, but see how it would have just been like a two hour plus show. And I just can't do that. So thank you everybody. And I will uh, talk to everybody tomorrow with Anthony DeMarco in our current state of WWE. If you want everything ad free and you just don't want to hear all all the uh, interruptions, patreon.com slash WWE podcast is the way to go. You can get exclusive shows by the way too, which are released Every week by Anthony DeMarco doing the After Dark, which is a SmackDown tier and above if you're interested. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. You can go to www.podcast.com too or Apple Podcasts for ad-free everything. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.